Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Christina Kokoris. I'm Director of Communications for Muse Collection. I'm here with Richard Grossbart, Advisor for Muse Collection. We would love to welcome you all to the Muse Collection space. We're thrilled to be programming partners with APAD this year and see this host of fantastic lectures. So with that, I will pass this off to Lydia, who will be saying a few words as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you for hosting us. Um, hello, I'm Lydia Malama Johnson. I'm the executive director of APAD. Welcome to the Photography Show 2023. We're thrilled to be partnering with Photographies Good New York and their fabulous hip hop exhibition for this talk. Um, I'm going to hand it over to your moderator shortly, but we're thrilled that we've partnered with Photographies Good New York this year. I hope you'll visit their stand, which is in the hall just behind you and to the right. It's really fantastic and actually shares a space with APAD Talks, which is a very acclaimed series that APAD has been doing for many years. And you can watch some of our old videos and interact a little bit more with the history of APAD. I'm gonna hand this over now to Meredith and she'll introduce your panel. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meredith Breach. I'm an exhibitions manager at Photographiska New York. Photographiska is a museum experience for the modern world with locations in Stockholm, New York City, and Tallinn, and opening in Berlin this fall. Founded in Stockholm in 2010, Photographiska is a destination to discover world-class photography, eclectic programming, and surprising new perspectives. Guided by a mission to inspire a more conscious world through the power of photography, we strive to offer dynamic and unparalleled rotating exhibitions spanning various photographic genres in inclusive and immersive environments. I was one of the organizers of Hip Hop Conscious Unconscious, which is on view at Photographiska through May 20th. And I'm joined here by a few of the photographers on view in the exhibition, T. Eric Monroe, Jeanette Beckman, and Sam Balaban, as well as one of the exhibition's curators, Sally Berman, and gallerist Nick Fahey. Thank you for joining us. I'll just begin by reading a quick introduction of each of our panelists. Um, Sally Bam Berman sorry, has worked as a photography editor since 2001. She directed, produced, and edited for music publications including XXL, Billboard, Respect, and Mass Appeal. She's edited photography for book titles including Decoded by Jay-Z, Beastie Boys book, Le Freak by Nile Rogers, The Sun and the Moon, and The Rolling Stones, amongst others. Sally currently is a visual director at Hearst Publications. Nick Fahey is an American art dealer at the Fahey Klein Gallery. Fahey's passion for photography is evident in the gallery's exhibitions and publications, which often focus on contemporary and classic photography. He has served on the board of directors of several arts organizations, including APAD, the Inglewood Photography Festival, and the Photography Council of the Los Angeles County Museum of Arts. Fahey has also been a guest lecturer and panelist at various art ev events and institutions. Now to our photographers, T. Eric Monroe. Uh, T. Eric Monroe's body of work features rare images and moments from the 90s, chronicling, chronicling the intertwining worlds of hip hop, skateboarding, and hardcore punk. Monroe's photography spotlights humanity in the creative process, capturing rich portraits that reveal a depth of feeling behind the stage personas. Monroe's body of work represents a fresh and unseen perspective of cultural icons from the hip hop community at a time before the internet, social media, and digital photography. Over the last 10 years, T. Eric Monroe started digitizing the work captured in the 90s and went on to author four hardcover books, Rare and Unseen Moments of 90s Hip Hop, and most recent ebook, A Visual History of Hip Hop, A Revolution in Culture, featuring 90s artists in the prime of their careers. Jeanette Beckman is a British born photographer who began her career in the punk rock era working for music magazines The Face and Melody Maker. Her work has been shown in galleries worldwide and is in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Museum of the City of New York, and the British National Portrait Gallery. 
She has published five books, including Rap Portraits and Lyrics of a Generation of Black Rockers, The Break Stylin' and Profilin', and The Mashup, a collaboration with iconic New York graffiti artists reinterpreting her hip-hop images. Her new monograph, covering 40 years of photography, Rebels from Punk to Dior, was recently published by Drago. Sam Balaban is a multimedia artist, photographer, and director interested in exploring human beings through visual storytelling. He began his career at the Fader magazine and used this entry point to begin photographing musicians both on and off the stage while also directing videos. Sam is interested in producing physical works of art derived from his photography, utilizing a variety of manipulation and collage-based techniques to sculpt and highlight the identities of the figures he's photographed. He is also interested in continuing his photography and video directing as the art of the moving image is and remains his first love. He specializes in creating engaging documentary content, but is also interested in producing imaginative, stylized video pieces of all kinds. Thank you. Um, so to begin, I would love for Sally to explain how this exhibition was curated to cover 50 years of hip hop. 50 years, five decades. It's a lot. Um, I didn't do it alone. Um, I worked on this with Sasha Jenkins, um, who we've known for our last 25 years, I want to say. Um, and we really started by making a list of the photographers that we knew. <laughs> uh, we'd both been working in hip hop for that long. Um, I'm currently not necessarily working at a hip hop publication of any sort. Um, so, you know. Making that list, obviously, it covered a lot of the 90s and the 80s. Um, we knew we wanted to start with um, Jean-Pierre Lafont, who photographed the Savage Skulls, um, which was a gang in the Bronx um, in like around 72, 73. So we knew we wanted to open with that. And then um, we really just started making lists and making calls and calling in archives, images that we knew we wanted to include to tell this story, and then looking at what was there and what was missing, what artists were missing, um, and doing lots of edit sessions. Um, it, was, it, was, it was an intense <laughs> five months, um, but I would say, well, did I answer your full question? What were you? Um, Maybe you could go through like the order of the exhibition. Oh, well. yeah. Well, we decided to do it chronological, um, which <coughs> made the most sense for us, and then also to break it down by genre, or not genre, by, um, but by region. Um, so to make sure that we really covered as much as we could with American hip hop. Um, and, you know, I think once we got to the contemporary artists, I myself had to do quite a bit of research, which is how I came upon finding Sam Balavin, uh, which was an amazing discovery for myself, um, and finding someone that was photographing some of the newer artists that I wasn't, you know, privy to or shooting on a regular basis anymore. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear from each person on the stage how your relationship with hip hop really began, um, both personally and professionally. <laughs> Jeanette, can okay. you start? Well, I, don't, I mean, if you're doing it chronologically. <coughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, of course not. <laughs> um, where's my little? Okay, so this, uh, this little book just came out. Um, it's part of uh, um, an exhibit at Saatchi right now in London. But my first interaction with hip-hop was in 1982 when the first ever New York City rap tour came to Europe. And we didn't know what hip-hop was. I was working for a little music magazine weekly called Melody Maker. And I put my hand up in the meeting like, oh, I'll go, I'll go check it out. And... I went to the place where everybody was staying uh, for the tour. It was like an Airbnb. And I just started photo photographing everybody. And I didn't know who they were. And that afternoon, I just photographed some of the, you know, godfathers and godmothers of the culture, which would be Africa Bambata, uh, Futura, Dondi, Ramel Z, 
Grand Mix, the DST, Fab Five Freddy, the Rocksteady Crew, the Double Dutch Girls. And they were all just there at the hotel and they had this amazing positive energy that we in England, we were used to punk, which was a little, n yeah, yeah, a bit kind of angrier, shall we say. And, uh, and they were dressed amazingly. I was just blown away by the style. And that night at the concert, all these people were all on stage together. Futura and Dondi were painting a backdrop, Fat Five Freddy was rapping, you know, Bam and DST were DJing, and it was all going, I was like, this is unbelievable. It was like a renaissance moment for me, and I came to visit a friend in New York a couple of months later, and uh, basically, I never left. So that's kind of how I first met hip hop, I think. Amazing. Um, my, my, um, I first met hip hop, um, I guess during the 80s, uh, as a kid from the suburbs, um, you know, as a skateboarder, uh, hip hop, punk rock was, were always a part of the musical landscape uh, of my teens and my youth. Um, and then professionally, as it related to photography, um, I first started uh, doing music features for Thrasher magazine in the music section. Um, so hip hop was the one thing that I really knew well enough where I could write about it and also capture the artist uh, at the same time. Um, so that's how I got my involvement in uh, professional photography, first through the publication. And then over time, I started servicing uh, stock agencies. Um, and then from there, uh, by the late, what was it, late 95, um, I became the photo editor at the Source magazine after Chi Mo Du. Uh, did that for a while and then transitioned into action sports marketing. But then uh, later on, 20 years almost later, I went back into the work and started pulling the stuff out and really looking at the work that I'd captured. And it wasn't from a business perspective of servicing magazines or servicing agencies. It was a perspective of what is this history that I've captured and pulling it out, digitizing it, and slowly sharing it on social media. And then looking at it now, like still, I get these breaths of fresh air. I'm like, wow, I actually captured this stuff. <laughs> you know. But I'm, I'm grateful uh, to have been a part of hip hop's history. Um, I've, um, I've grown, I've loved hip hop since I was a little kid. I grew up with hip hop surrounding me on all sides. Um, around nine or 10, I was in 2000, 2003 era is when I first started to like really digest a lot of music heavily and it was all hip hop. Um, gr I mean, just growing up, hip hop was all around me and I couldn't get enough of it once I got access to the internet and I found this whole ecosystem of music that I hadn't, that dated me back decades and I just fell in love with it, uh, everything about it, the way they sampled other genres and that led me on to musicians I would have never found out about, funk and soul albums and jazz albums that I never would have found out about if it wasn't for hip hop. And I always knew that I wanted this. This was like my main thing that I loved besides like, I also love sports and stuff, but, and then I was very visual because my parents, I feel like were very visual. Um, and when I got to college, I applied for some internships at some media magazines, got into one, thankfully. And it was like a dream to be involved in hip hop professionally. And I just did everything I can to start photographing the artists I loved and covering the scene and discovering the artists and um, that's really how I ended up uh, where I am today just loving the music from as young as I can remember and wanting to be involved and just being a part of the ecosystem I kind of studied since I was a younger younger person I grew up listening to hip-hop music um, through the 90s and always loving it. Um, but I got my, you know, my first career after college. I went to a photography college here in, in New York and was working in galleries throughout college. And the, uh, <laughs> the owner of the gallery actually knew someone that worked at Double XL and got me an interview, and I got the job, so I really fell into hip hop again um, as a career, but it was kismet because I've been working in it n now ever since, so 20 some years um, doing books and magazines for hip hop. Yeah. 
So I, I'm, you know, a kid of the 90s, and I grew up in Los Angeles, and if you grew up in Los Angeles in the 90s, K-Day was how you got into hip-hop kind of a thing, and it was this amazing radio station that had all, you know, it was like pre-internet, like I couldn't search the internet for all of this stuff, and so, you know, definitely had a culture and, and a history of understanding of like funk and soul and early jazz, but, you know, hip-hop was on the radio, and it's what all my friends were listening to, and it's what everybody was, you know, reacting to, and now... You know, I'm a, I'm in a legacy gallery. You know, and I watched my father selling pictures of Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix, and that's great. But you know, my generation wants Slick Rick and Snoop, and so it's a whole new exciting realization in terms of you know continuing this collecting conversation that really you know is you know a, a study of American history and how people are connecting with all that stuff. So. For me, I'm in a really privileged place where I get to, you know, easily introduce this stuff. And, you know, I understand the whole museum world and the gallery world and the book world. And so I can kind of just help recontextualize and help redigest and, you know, put it in this place where we are selling prints. And, you know, this stuff is ending up in museums and it is traveling shows. And, you know, it's bringing, you know, humans have been communicating with images and symbols longer than the languages we speak today. And so it's that thing of, you know, putting these images out there to bring as many people into museums and to bring them into galleries and to bring everybody in. So that's, I guess, my background. Great, thank you guys. So to your point about hip hop being a part of American history, much of the photography on view in the exhibition is kind of considered historical now. But the newest images on view, which are capturing kind of the current extension of this history, do have a fine art approach to them. They're commercial, of course, but they're portraits with a distinct visual style that really stand on their own. Sam's work in particular is a great example of this. Um, Sally, can you speak to the shift in visual languages over the past 50 years in capturing hip hop? I'll do my best. <laughs> um, you know, I, at least through our exhibition, it really starts with reportage um, through the you know the late '70s into the '80s, and then you go into the '90s when you know the artists became more conscious. The world was noticing there was money starting to flow. Um, there was albums, there was record deals, there were movies happening. There was collaborations with you know fashion brands. Um, so the the production value really changed on set um, and the collaboration started to happen. So you had, you know, you were starting to work with wardrobe stylists and build set designs and really start to tell a story in these images. Um, and now, you know, I can't say exact, like I'm not the audience for, you know, what's happening now in hip hop, but it looks very different. Um, rappers don't look like rappers that they, in the 90s, so I think the photography changed with that because the the music has changed as well. So I would say that you know it's a little bit more experimental now. It's not just the you know gangster rapper. You know it was never just that, but it's not. Um, it doesn't look like how you would expect it to look now. I think, um, and so because of that, there is more color. There is more experimentation with lighting, um, and also budgets have really changed. You've gone from you know, having no money <laughs> to having a ton of money in the 90s <laughs> to now having, you know, at least from an editorial perspective, like we have no money at all again. It's like from the beginning days. So it's about being more experimental, I would say, now. Um, but what do you guys think? <laughs> yeah, please, Nick. I mean, I was, so right when I met Sam, I started talking about this, right? Because yeah looking at Jeanette's work, looking at Eric's work, it's, yeah. and you see this through so many art forms, it's the iterative qualities of it, right? You know, and there was, you know, and even talking about, you know, an Albert Watson or a Mark Seliger, you know, people like, like you know, Eric, you were in the moment, you were there, you were photographing this stuff, you were reacting to the scene, and Jeanette was doing the same kind of thing, and so it's so interesting to watch that practice, like you're saying, go into the studio practice. Yeah. But also now, you know, reportage it's like you know you're following these heroes around and then they're creating this scene and putting this thing together and now as you go down to Sam and he's this like you know how many other generations of it and it's like these people are deified in his pictures right you know it's like these scenes that are created and these atmospheres that are made and you have to have that arc mm -hmm. you know and it's so fascinating to see 
how that works in so many other in so many other art forms as well too. But in that sense of you know humans and, and communicating and, and channeling these things and going through, it's it's you know it's fascinating for me and great because that's the whole conversation I'm trying to create, right? Is it's how do you contextualize the 20th century in the 21st century conversation yeah. and find those connect points so that you can you know tell that American kind of history story. Do you find that collectors are really responsive to that? Yeah, I mean, well, that's, that's you know, I'm 41, right? And so it's this thing where I have, like, young collectors come in, and I'm like, look at this, you know, Jim Morrison picture. And they're like, that's awesome. My dad has that, you know? And I'm like, okay, cool. Does he want to sell it? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? But, uh, but also, at the same time, like, you know, I always talk about my job is much more of, like, I don't, I don't push things on people, right? Like, my whole thing is, like, figuring out who you are, what you like, and then getting stoked with you on stuff, pulling things out and showing them to, to you and showing, and then you being like, oh, I love that, I don't really like that. Oh, well, if you love this and you don't like that, you'll probably like this, and then you might like that, but don't look at that, you're gonna hate that. <laughs> you know, and it's, that's the really fun part of it for me. And, you know, so do I see these changes happening? All the time. I've been working in cannabis culture for a long time as well, and, you know, had a bunch of friends that were growers, and I'm watching this group of people come in and start collecting. And what they're reacting to is way different than generations before, or way different than the crypto tech bro who's doing NFTs, and I'm trying to get them to come in the gallery kind of a thing. So it's, it's fun. My job's great. I get to have, like, 19 different conversations every single day about completely <laughs> different things. I don't know if that answered any of your question, but... No, I think yeah. you covered it. Cool. <laughs> um, Eric and Jeanette, were you guys aware at the time when you were working and shooting some of the images on view that you were capturing a historical moment, something that people would look back on? Uh, share the mic. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I mean... No, absolutely. I would say the answer is 100% no, because and, uh, yeah. these guys were like at the beginning of their career, and I was just reading something that you wrote on Instagram about Tupac, photographing Tupac, and they he took a break, something, oh and yeah. you, right, and you got a picture of him, like, and you heard him light up the, the cigarette. I, I was like, that's the story, and that was kind of how it was, right. and I think in some ways, like, back in the day, we were pretty documentary style. I agree. Uh, for me, like, well, I think in the, in the early 90s, I can, I can say, and moving forward, there was no historical record to reference against in terms of telling uh, the story, not just about hip-hop, but about the, the scene that you were capturing because it was pre-digital. Um, more than anything, I think, for the, the way that I was shooting, or m maybe even Jenna as well, you were shooting sometimes uh, for an assignment, or you were sh shooting it to hopefully get it into a magazine, maybe sell it to a record label, just where you knew that there was life or, uh, or there was life for it to go into somewhere. Um, but beyond that, you didn't think 10 years from now, you didn't, I didn't think 20 years from now. Um, but I, I think just in the immediate moment, and then also once you shot something within a three month period, it was of no longer a value to a publication or a stock agency, so you sort of put it to the side. But then now you can look, you know, may maybe from Sam's perspective where he can see like, okay, in ten years, ten years, this is this type of cycle. In twenty years, this is this type of cycle. So it allows you to not only in the moment um, capture the moment, but also be um, mindful of the moment you're capturing, taking notes about it, uh, to use it as historical reference. So later on, you know, ten, fifteen years from now, you can go back and write a book against it. So a lot of even what Jeanette was talking about, where I was writing about Tupac and the moment in the day that I captured him, um, I was there because I wasn't on assignment. I was there just to watch him and photograph him and just there was no end goal in it so the moments that I spent around him were f from an op observational perspective not from okay I have to get this into the newspaper or to the magazine because they're looking for this shot or this angle it was purely just watching documenting and and being a fly on the wall watching him and his friends have fun mm. right, now I gotta say uh, probably a lot of the times I don't know about you but we were not getting paid huge amounts of money no. we didn't have stylists we didn't have hair makeup in the in the beginning, no, there was there were no budget. No, just and as you guys I were saying. And early on, um, I, 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 my uh, adventure into photography, into music, the music industry was from a suburban kid perspective. So every day I spent my own money to come to New York to photograph these artists. I had to spend money on film processing. You name it, I spent all my money on everything. Whereas some people, you know, now get these amazing budgets to capture <laughs> an artist, you know, th like for one-time rights usage, and they still make us a lot of money off of it. So from, uh, during our day, we did it out of passion, but we, we knew that what we were doing was important because we could see the artist 
uh, in a different light rather than just the typical, you know, Carver shot, if you would. Like there was something about them that, that drew us into them that allowed our images of these people, uh, of are these artists, to speak even today, 10, 20, or 30 years later. Yeah. Yeah, things now move so incredibly fast, like unimaginably fast, where it's like, I mean, most of my work, pretty much all of my work, ex ex except for special occasions when things are in print or in a show, are all online. And millions of other photographers are sharing their work online. Hundreds of thousands are probably sharing hip hop based photos online. And I'm, I'm still in my first decade of shooting, covering hip hop culture and photography. So I don't necessarily know what it will stick. And I'm gonna be very, it's gonna be very curious to see which of my photos, if any, hopefully s surpass multiple decades like Jeanette and T. Eric's. Um, but the oversaturation, is it Eric or is it T. Eric? It's, it's T. Eric Monroe, but we're friends, so you can just call me Eric. Okay, <laughs> Eric. <laughs> Eric. Um, I think for me, it's like the oversaturation of the industry I as a whole is a very, um, it puts a lot of pressure uh, to stand out and to um, create images that stand out from everybody else's, um, but also not forcing it and letting the creative ideas you have inform your work rather than the pressure to stand out and to um, to really capture the essence of these artists regardless of the time period it is or the circumstance you're shooting them under. Like I do a lot of live show photography, which is a lot different than in studio work, but I think um, the premise is the same, is trying to hone in on what makes the artist special and um, platform that and um, hope that the fan bases of these artists and the world at large see what makes them special as well and to constantly innovate the way you're photographing and sharing images so that the genre and the, the language around covering it continues to grow in the midst of all the saturation. So that's what I've tried to do over the past few years, seeing, um, uh, just trying to conjure up new ways of displaying this genre and hoping that these styles lead to younger people creating working off what I did and uh, so on and so forth and hopefully that work uh, lives as long as it can. That's what, that's what I'm trying to do. You've done actually a really great job of that, especially I'm thinking of your sculptural pieces of taking the photographic genre and kind of moving it into a precious one-of-a-kind object. Do you want to kind of describe for people that haven't been to the show and haven't sure. seen the work? So um, yeah, I I, I always wanted to create physical art. Well, no, maybe not always, but in the past few years I did, and I always knew hip hop was worthy of that a treatment in the form of beautiful prints and shows and beyond. So during 2020, I was no longer able to photograph in person, and I have this huge archive, and uh, I primarily shoot, I shoot film and digital, but a lot of the live work is primarily digital, so I have these thousands of photos of shows and it gave me a lot of time to revisit the work and I just started getting really weird and creati creative and trying to pull from different sources and I started making these collages of artists with multiple limbs and arms and just things that I thought was was new and cool to me and um, they're, very cool. they're 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 pretty they're they're interesting <laughs> And nobody was making anything like it from what I saw that uh, and, and the people uh, that are covering hip hop. And, and then I collaborated with an artist who was Parisian based, who uh, his name is Farid Issa and he's an amazing, he's almost like a very technical artist. He, he brings photos and prints them on Chromalux aluminum. It's like a Chromalux style of printing dye sublimation on aluminum and he sort of dissects the image in a way where different parts of the image live on different layers and then he uses copper and metal pegs to have the layers come off of a metal board and so it gives a 3D element to the image and we collaborated and we made these really, really fascinating pieces uh, of my live 
live uh, hip hop photography. And it was like the culmination of a couple years of me just trying to figure out new ways of like treating uh, these images that I knew had had value that I just had to sort of uh, pull out the more I kind of looked at them and messed with them. So that's just one example of I think that newer uh, photographers covering this genre, I feel like they should really sit with their work and um, especially if they're shooting digital, they're shooting a lot of work and just like really try to figure out what's at the heart of what you're shooting and what you find interesting and just try to really pull everything you can out of it and make something new for people to get inspired by. That's kind of the idea with them. Sam is really modest. These works are really <laughs> cool. <laughs> if you get the chance to come to the museum and see them, they're, they're really worth seeing. Yeah, I, I just want to point one thing out in the sense of like, and I don't know if this is talked about enough within this kind of world where you have people who are shooting commercial purposes, right? It's this re-edit process. Are you editing for the job or are you editing for yourself? Um, and I think that's something that I'm also really lucky to get to do is go back with these artists and help them edit for themselves and help identify that stuff. And I think that's really where, you know, that authentic culture comes out where, you know, you guys have images now that are decades old and still have that power and that resonance. And I think kind of Sam said it perfectly. He's like, you know, waiting to see which one of those images he's going to have that continue that presence and continue to communicate you know, decades later with different generations. Yeah, I think, like, the work of uh, Jeanette and Eric and the original, and the people who covered hip-hop from the beginning, it's so special. It's just so special. Um, I don't, you put so much effort into creating it, but it's just, the, I think the process in which you make images is so much different than what I am doing, but I think the goal is kind of exactly the same in trying to make things that really like immortalize your subjects and just try to like pull out, pull what's there, um, amplify it. So I don't come from the, the background of, of shooting film and developing and stuff. I like to shoot film and get it developed, but um, it's just interesting. Like the newer photographers have so many different ways of creating at their disposal and it's what? You used an aura camera. An aura camera? The aura cam, the ones with all the different colors. Those are digital manipulations. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I'm just saying there's just so many ways to create images now and the goal I think is the same is to um, create images that are that last the test of time regardless of how you're creating them. Um, for the photographers on stage. Can you tell me about an image or a shoot early on in your career where you felt a shift in how you approach your, audi your audience or your subject matter? Um, well, I have to say when I came to America, it was really useful being a British woman going into you know, places like the Bronx to shoot Africa Bambata or, you know, meeting Run DMC and Hollis, Hollis Queens because they were surprised to see me there. And it really, my photos are really a collaboration between me and the subject. And that's, I have to, my, you know, my superpower maybe is <laughs> <laughs> being able to make that relationship in a minute or two or three because often you don't have a lot of time and getting people to trust you and treating people with respect and you know figuring that out and I think being a British woman helped a lot because a lot of times they were like who are you what are you doing here and you know that's why I think Salt and Pepper asked me to be their photographer for all their albums because I was different you know and I think that made my work a bit different and my approach a bit different because yeah, it's just, you know, you're kind of a stranger in a strange land in a way. And that was, I had a different eye. And also, they had a different perception of me as a photographer. I think if I'd been an American guy, maybe, you know, white guy, it might have been harder. So I think that's probably the answer. Um, for me, a, a shift in a perspective. Uh, it would have to be specifically... Um, I can use one of two moments. W the first one that comes to mind is uh, when I photographed uh, Old Dirty Bastard of the Wu-Tang Clan um, in 1995. Initially, you know, I had 
in my mind, we were going to shoot photograph on the rooftop uh, in the Lower East Side. A typical, you know, hip hop thing, rooftop skyline. Uh, when we first met, he said, let's, he wanted to go to his barber up in uh, Harlem. So I said, okay, so we got in his uh, car service, we went up to Harlem, and I'm waiting for him as, you know, the barber comes over, puts the apron on, you know, starts to trim him up, and I n happen to look, I mean, I watch him, he's staring at me, watching me, and I'm like, okay, maybe I should get out my camera. So I watched him getting shaved, you know, photographed him being trimmed up, and then at the very end, as the barber takes the apron off, he goes into his pocket, takes out his glasses, that ha his sunglasses that have one lens, and he stares at me, and I capture that moment. So for him, that was the moment that he wanted, even though I had this other moment set in my mind of what I wanted to shoot for his feature. So we ended up going back to Lower East Side, photographed some beautiful moments of him uh, on the rooftop uh, in the Lower East Side, but what that showed me in shooting that was be flexible to whatever your subject might want to do because that's going to open up a whole other avenue of images or moments um, that you could, that's going to be offered to you to share and to capture. Um, and the, but it's also okay to have your safe shots in mind, but be flexible because so much more can be revealed to you. And when you're shooting on the street, you never know what's going to happen. Like, <laughs> I was shooting this hip hop group called The Freshmen one day, and we're just outside a deli on Avenue C. And they've got a boombox and school let out. And all these school kids came, like little eight-year-old kids. And they all jumped in the picture because they're like, oh, photo shoot, yay. Oh, and awesome. I got this <laughs> picture of all these kids. There's a little tiny kid standing on the boombox. And, you know, the band is not even important in that picture. It's really about the kids. And I think you have, like, you just have to be open to things happening. Spontaneity, yeah. 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 Um, I think... One uh, moment that stands out was, it was like 2018, and I was, it's, it speaks to the spontaneity, because I was in LA for something, and I didn't, hadn't really gone to LA that much, and there was an artist I always really liked, his name was Mac Miller, and uh, he liked my work from Instagram, and I messaged him to, to do something like video related, and he, I, he was down for it, so I went to his house and we made this sick, like, one-shot <laughs> video of him doing this amazing rap, and it was amazing. And I brought a little Contax T3 with 35 roll in it. And I wasn't there for, f for film, for photo, but I just was, like, shooting one-handed random, like, shots of the room and of him. And I, 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 he was playing keys, he was an amazing keyboard player. And I was there, and I just roost over and took a photo, like not even looking of the keys. And I got the roll back, and the f this photo that I took without like really looking at anything, it was like perfectly. The horizon line of the image was perfectly, like it reminded me of like the symmetry of like your photo of um, Queen Latifah. You have a photo of Queen Latifah in a show where it's like a, a one by one square, and it's like the composition is like absolutely perfect with no crop and I was like like shooting film and not having to crop your image horizon line or anything is like really incredible skill but anyway it was a totally random incident and then he passed away um, very like a month later and it was extremely tragic and um, but that image became sort of um, an immortalizing and people came to me trying to purchase that image a lot. And um, it just showed that I was there because I loved his music and I took photos because I love to take the photos. And I ended up getting a very spontaneous image that has um, touched a lot of people. And I think that's really at the heart of what we're all doing is covering things we love. And, and when you cover things you love, um, I think that you end up making work that that touches people. So that was like one of the, that was a cha life changing shoot uh, that year. Yeah, yeah. One thing to your point, what where you were just talking about reaching out with your camera and just capturing that perfect moment. I think part of it is uh, there's a certain intuition where you get to a certain point when you're shooting that you just trust your gut. Because I, I know from uh, of our era, we can say um, we shot on film, and for me, uh, there was I didn't have a. Polaroid backing, the majority of the stuff I shot was 35, some was 120, but you had to trust your gut, you had to know your lighting, you had to, uh, just you just felt 
and knew what you were capturing, that you were going to be able to capture it so when you got it back from the photo lab, you were able to s you know, sell it to a magazine or a photo stock agency and you were able to go on to do the next thing. But you had to trust your gut that you knew what you were doing. You hadn't, there was no, oh, let me check this, my, my phone and let me check the back of the, you just had to know what you were shooting and have uh, enough belief in yourself and your subject that you were gonna get it right. Yeah, I think definitely, I think it says something that that photo I took, the one that has probably my people know my, my they know that photo more than any other photo of mine was on taken on film, and I, mm -hmm. I do think there's a power in s shooting film, and um, I need to do it more. <laughs> still, <laughs> it's just uh, very expensive, and <laughs> and um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the digital stuff I still love too, but I think there's beauty in both, and I always try to show that there's beauty in both. But that shot was film, so. Um, I have a question for Sally and Nick. So is there ever a time throughout your careers where you've kind of seen a photographer's visual style kind of crystallize or seen a shift in their visual practice that you could speak about? Um, yeah, th probably several, but um, Kenneth Capello, who's also in the show, I think when I first started working with him in the early 2000s, his work was much more on-camera flash, very raw. He would go photograph a lot of stuff for Supreme as well as for Double XL, um, and go to the, the, the subject's homes, um, usually put up a white background. And now if you look at his work, especially in our show, it's way more technical. And he's always had that background. He studied under a lot of different photographers, but he's really created his own style, and I've just been really blown away by it. So it wasn't necessarily in front of me, but I've just watched his career really grow, um, and it's just gotten more and more beautiful. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'm I'm at the end, right? So it's, it's less of seeing when it's happening in time, yeah. like you're seeing on the editorial sense, and more of me going looking at 2,000 images and finding that arc and finding how to tell that story too, right? Because it's that one thing where you, as much as they've changed their style, it's about showing that, that grad, like, cause I'm, I'm talking about like editing books, right? In terms of putting those books together and putting those exhibitions together to kind of show what that change was because, you know, if you just show what that style is, you don't show the growth. And so for me, it's always really fascinating to, you know, dive into people's work, look through these things, and then, you know, help, like that's going back to that re-editing process, you know, going back in there and be like, look, this is where it changed. And, and knowing that it changed then because knowing what has happened, you know, and then knowing what has happened before that. Um, and so, yeah, I, get, I, I see it all the time, you know, and, and that's one of the things I get to do is help, help them then identify that and then, you know, because it's all visual language, you know, and so it, it's also that thing too of, I'm not doing anything special. <laughs> I'm just reading the, the story and helping put the things in line mm -hmm. for that visual language to just, you know, kind of pop a little bit more. So we've talked a little bit today about how the difference in these 50 years and how photography itself and capturing this history has changed. But I'm wondering maybe a little bit from Sam and Sally, like how photographers are adjusting to these changes and where we think music photography is kind of headed? I know that's a huge question, but. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think it's a, I hope it's an opportunity for um, experimentation now. I mean, like I was saying before, like the artist, are pulling from all different places now, and I don't even know the most popular rapper right now, I'll be very <laughs> honest. Um, but they don't look like the rappers that I was photographing in 2000 by any means, and I think it's shifted the way that the photography looks. So, you know, a lot of the photographer, uh, rappers have kind of like photographers that are part of their crew now too, so they're able to control a little bit more of their image. Um, from an editorial stance, there's still sometimes room, more room for collaboration um, and for hopefully some spontaneity, which is some of the most important photos, I think, in the show and from our work that we've always been able to do. Um, but where, I mean, it's, the potential is, is huge. I don't, um, I don't, I don't know either where it's going. I know that people will always need these images. Yeah. Um, they'll always need photographs and how it's put together is, you know, definitely changing every day. 
photographers of my age and who are um, participating now, they they have free reign to basically use any medium and any style that they want, uh, and that is that allows for pretty much anything to happen. And so I really don't know. I think. I think everything is sort of limi living simultaneously right now in terms of how images are created. But I think there's a lot of hip hop photographers that are still shooting beautiful medium format film images and 35 millimeter like film images in studio and out of studio, and that stuff is thriving and beautiful. And a lot of a lot of artists prefer that and solely want that look. And it all depends on the artist. I think. You're right, artists nowadays, they are extremely particular in how they are, the images of themselves are curated and they become sort of spoiled to have that ability, I think. And um, so it, it kind of honestly relies on, on the people making the music. I think our images are, I think there are limits to what we can produce. I think because the subjects are defining their own styles we have to work with But Sam, people are coming to you because of your style, because you have a very times. unique That's style, true. you and know, and we have technology now that is like changing yeah. so much daily that um, they are looking for those artists. They are looking for people to collaborate with that can help tell their vision. It's true. They get um, inspiration from they us. They do, exactly. It's, it's, it's reciprocal. It's our total working, re it's a the relationship is extremely yeah, you're right. You're right. And also make it, I mean, make it, make a different image, right? You know, because everybody can look at their pictures and remake these pictures. Yeah. You know, and there's this thing you can style them and you can do them, but it's not about that. You know, it's about doing something different. And to your point, yeah, they're going to him because they know it's going to be different and they know yeah. it's going to elevate them to a whole other level. I think another thing that's very fascinating with hip hop and it just lends itself to how hip hop music is made too is like. Um, like hip hop always is sampling other genres beautifully and excellently and I think hip hop photography and styles of covering the culture does the same thing with other mediums film and art and etc so like for example there's um, there was a crew of guys that covered like ASAP for a while this gr uh, group of rappers in New York called ASAP and there was a specific period where they are referencing um, the art of like George Kondo, who's a fine artist, and their video edits and their covers and stuff were these amazing mashups of um, mixed medium that was being inspired by a fine artist. And I think that happens a whole lot. Like yeah. Kendrick Lamar music videos, the director is constantly referencing images from Gordon Parks in his his little vignettes and music videos. And so I honestly think that. Um, that is gonna just going to keep happening, and artists are going to consist const like keep referencing the past and coming up with new ways of of um, coming up with brand new perspectives that kind of stem off the amazing work that already exists. Is what yeah. I think, and I think that's when the best work that's like the best stuff is like referencing what's already been done and done like perfectly. Eric and Jeanette. When you guys were shooting, how much say did an artist have in how they were captured, or were you given kind of strict instructions from the magazines you were shooting for? How did that work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, no, no, s oops, no strict instructions whatsoever. And honestly, you know, it'd just be me. Like for instance, the Run DMC picture that I have of Hollis in Hollis in 1984, that was commissioned by. Neville Brody from The Face, who's you know maybe the best graphic British graphic designer, I would say. And he just gave me a phone number, and it was Jam Master Jay's mom's house. And <laughs> then I met Jam Master Jay, and I went to the picture, and that was it. There was no art direction, but I knew the magazine because I'd been working for them already for you know four years, and I knew Neville, and I knew what he wanted. So in my head, it was just me and the band, but in my head I had, you know, the play of what was needed. And, um, you know, that was, I mean, most of the album covers, they just pretty much left it up to me and the band. And that's great. 
as a photographer to have that freedom and you know I don't know no I agree with you I, I never had a, um, a situation where the label or the artist or anyone was sort of looking over my shoulder f because for the most part throughout my career um, it was freelance and the access that I, I was given towards the artist um, it was sort of like I serviced the work after the fact so I, for me to get the moments with the artists themselves was on my own time, my own dime. Um, the artist trusted me enough to allow me into their space. Um, and depending on what I saw, or what, what, what was going on, or saw the artists themselves and how I captured them, it was in a very intimate, uh, kind, soft way where the artist didn't, also the artist didn't see the work immediately after because it wasn't digital. So they didn't see it in print for another three months or so if it got into print, you know. And then if it didn't uh, back then get into print at all, they didn't see it until if we're talking, let's say, 95, they probably didn't see it if they saw it digitally until 2019, 2020. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's quite different because an example I can give you is, um, is with the pictures of Lauren Hill, the one that's an, on exhibit at the Hip Hop uh, at Photographiska, the picture of her in the hallway that was shot in 1997 on a music video set that she was directing. And I, I went there just because I knew Com and I knew uh, Lauren Hill and, and I just wanted to capture part of the day. But no one wanted to pick up the material at the time. So it wasn't until I started working on, you know, sharing my stuff on social media and then working on my books that anyone had reference to it. And I remember sending uh, Lauren my fourth book, which was my collector's edition gold book. I sent it to her in the mail with a, a note and some other stuff. And I remember her sending me an email uh, because she wanted to license some stuff. But she was, you know, like she didn't know that that moment existed, you know, but she was interested in like, well, you know, she was basically telling me, you know, if you're ever going to go through a regular publisher, you'd have to get my permission to do this, to do that. But I'm like, really? <laughs> this is how many years removed? But it, it's one of those things where, art, yeah, where, where artists now know that they have some control over their image in, in a major publication or something like that. But I think with, if you have the relationship with the artist, like, like we were able to do back in, uh, in our day, if you want to say it that way, we had a special friendship with the artists themselves because it wasn't this m social media instant, instant, instant world. It was a completely different world. So your relationship to the artist, your relationship um, even to the management was completely different than it is now. So w it was, a, it was a, a time where if you were a good person, you made it. If you had a good heart, people trusted you. So it made a difference because it even showed in your work. Yeah, that's a, that is so true. Yeah. And I have to, there's a, I think the ice cube picture that you put in the show mm -hmm. with the, with the car, with with the the car. car. Yeah. right. <laughs> I mean, I never even thought about that picture, but yeah. And then I, it's, it's in the show. I posted it on Instagram and people love it. And it's not a picture that I would say was my icon picture of that day. And, you know, it's, it's great to kind of go back to the archive and find kind of gems that you just took just because you were there during the day, you know, <laughs> taking a picture of him with his mom on, his por on her porch. Oh. And then I got, you know, here's the girlfriend comes with the tracker and get that picture too. And it suddenly becomes a, a kind of more important picture. And it's right. so great just to have all those things. And you're right, because we never saw them. That's right. exactly it. I shot it on two and a quarter film, yeah. and I never really looked at it until recently, yeah. so uh, yeah. when I scanned it. So. Thank, thank God you did, because I think yeah, with, within the era that we live in now, where we ha have this moment of freedom to go back and look through our archive and, and look at different moments, it allows us to see moments we didn't think were relevant or think were anything uh, back then. And an example of that for me is another image in Photographiska. It's an image of Biggie and Tupac together in 1993, and I call it friendship. But in the moment when I captured it in 1993, uh, I was actually shooting Onyx um, for a piece in Thrasher magazine. And, and we were shooting on stage prior to a show. And after I finished photographing Onyx, I hear these guys yell, come take our picture. So I, Onyx went back to the dressing room. I walked over to the guys that were on the side of the stage. I looked at them took one picture, said thank you, and then I went back to Onyx's dressing room. And it wasn't until, oh Jesus, uh, 2013 or 14 when I was going back through my files that I looked at this one slide that said Tupac middle finger, and I put it on the light box and put it in a loop, and I really started staring at it, and I started laughing because I realized it was Biggie, Tupac, Little Caesar all together wearing I'm a Bad Boy, which is Biggie's record label, but I didn't yeah. know who these guys were in the moment that I was capturing. I just simply gave you know someone a courtesy moment of taking a picture. You're just getting that moment, and you don't have time in that second to absorb all the things that are actually in the picture, and it's only years later when you're like, shit. Yeah. Yeah, like, 
you know, that tracker car is right. like really important yeah. in car culture. Right. Yeah. But I was just like, oh, this is cool, yeah. you know. So, uh, and that's that's what's kind of great about going back in the archives. Don't throw anything away, no, even ever, digital. Ever. No, so I do I not sip, throw sip. anything away. Bec that's all. That's really. I'm really glad to hear you both have s experiences like that because just even the collage stuff that I did, the very first collage I ever made in that style was, I made it in 2021, and it was from one of like the first, maybe not, ma one of like the first seven or eight shows I ever shot, and those were images that I just forgot about but during covid i was really p looking through everything i shot and i just started scheming on what was there that i that 22 year old me didn't see that 20 or 21 year old me didn't see that 28 or 29 year old whatever yeah. i don't <laughs> i remember back then i feel like <laughs> <laughs> i hope i really hope that never ends i hope that in 10 in 10 i really hope i can keep looking back and seeing new things cuz don't throw anything away because you never know what you're going to see in them a decade later or whatever. So that that's makes me really happy to hear you both have that uh, thought mindset as well. And then also just allowing yourself the freedom of mind where you're not pressured because of assignment to go back and look at your work. You can see it with a different type of breath. Um, and then it also gives you a different perspective about what you shot because it wasn't pressured for a record label, it wasn't pressured for this assignment. And you can really, really look at your images and now because everything's so digital, you can you know, color balance it properly, crop it, crop it properly, and then share it how you really want to share it. And then like the world appreciates your work because I'm grateful for social media because back in the 90s, there was no internet, there was no social media. So now to be able to share the work via social media, publications and everything else now, I can have the freedom because of social media where I can show images that a magazine wouldn't show. I can take you know 20 to 30 images, put them in a 30 second clip but with music and make my own little music video showing a montage of moments of a specific artist. So now we're in an era where we can play with our moments, have fun with our moments, but we can also take certain moments and, and present them as fine art at the same time. So we're living in a very special era right now. Definitely. Yeah. And for us, it's like so special um, to get your work in print in any capacity nowadays, in a show, in a magazine, and even to just print your own work and sell it, it is like truly um, special uh, because of how dominant digital is. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to keep keep doing that because I know that that's that stuff matters. Great, I think that's our time. Unless anyone has any final thoughts they'd like to share. Great. All right. Thank you guys so much for joining us.